Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, another special edition of Cabaret Corner. This is Broadway World's um, race panel discussion, uh, talking about equity, inequity, diversity, inclusion, today's current political climate, and how it manifests uh, both in the cabaret communities and also in the Broadway communities and beyond. I am Ari Axelrod. Um, my pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm I'm here to hold space and to have a uh, a fantastic and necessary and important conversation. So let's all go around and introduce ourselves. Okay. <laughs> I am Florencia Cuenca. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Hi, everyone. I'm Raymond J. Lee. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Howdy from Socrates, New York. Hey, I am Blaine Alden Krause. Pronouns he, him, his. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much, three of you, for being here. This is so, um, I, I don't know if it's exciting. I was going to say exciting. It's, um, it's it's very I'm honored to be in this room with all of you, and uh, I'm curious um, what your um, history is, your involvement with uh, the cabaret scene or the the concert scene in New York is. How did you get started in that? Do it. <laughs> Do it, do it, do it. I feel it, take us there, take us there. Go for it. Well, I am from Mexico City, from La Ciudad de Mexico. In my native language, it sounds delicioso. That's why I have to say it, in La Ciudad de Mexico. I came to New York five years ago. I moved with my husband five years ago. And actually, we came for a honeymoon. My husband uh, did his master's here at NYU, and we... We're always wondering, like, oh, we should move to New York. That's where we have to be, where we wanted to be. Um, and actually, the cabaret scene, it was like the first who opened the doors for me. I came, I did, uh, in that time, I just released an album that is called The New Standards, that it's musical theater songs, like contemporary musical theater songs with um, jazz arrangements, and they are in Spanish. So it was really diverse, you know, like diversity all the way. Um, so the the cabaret scene is the first who who opened the the doors for me, and I am very grateful. I think it's like a mm, like the people, the audience in New York, they they know what to expect in some way. So if you are like me with a thick accent and sometimes you treat and sometimes you say something that it's maybe not grammatically, grammatically correct, uh, you're welcome. I, I have felt very welcome. And as an immigrant, that's really hard. Like during these times, uh, but I, I am so far, so far, so good. <laughs> um. Yeah, so I, um, sure, yeah, I, um, I'm a, a actor, singer as well, um, you know, done uh, some Broadway shows and such, but I actually was just thinking um, while um, Florencia yes. was speaking that uh, my very first show in the city, I did Lion King tour right out of college, so I didn't get a chance to move to the city, but my very first night in the city, I did a show at um, 54 Below with Scott Coulter. And um, he does a lot of programming and he's this company, Spot on Entertainment. Um, so I actually, same thing, I got my introduction to the city by um, being in a cabaret space. And um, I call myself like a uh, like obsessive, joyful gigger. So performing in those types of spaces mm. Um, that are just songs or a compilation of songs or whether it's my own show or being in other people's show is actually a joy I get a lot out of. I feel like you get to reach people in multiple different ways and through different stories and settings. And um, uh, yeah, so I've been, I, I do a lot of that in the city um, um, and did my first 
a cabaret solo show last fall at 54 Below. Um, so that's been kind of my introduction and, and placement in the world. And, and it's been, um, I, I agree the audiences for sure are the most welcoming and for the most part are, um, you know, the cabaret environment really allows you to be much more intimate and no matter really what the show is or if it's for a specific cause or what have you, there's that intimacy factor that is why we're kind of in that environment. So the audiences have been great. Um, and we'll get in the discussion later. I think more, there's more discussion on the institution of the cabaret setting and the um, places in which we do those and the people who kind of have the most um, power in the sense of they can help expose more people, topics, sounds, um, you know, images to people. Um, but it's a great space. It, it's the best space. It, it can be the most healing space because that's what we're doing. Intimacy. We're craving getting to know people and that's why we love it. And if we reminded ourselves of that is really why we love to be there within the context of what's going on right now, it can, it can, we can really flip it on its head and really use it, the art for healing like it's supposed to be. Love that. Um, I, I started off too just doing theater. Um, I think when I first moved to New York, I was always so scared. I had gone to cabarets, I'd gone to concerts. I was always so scared of, can I do that? Can I get on stage and do what those amazing people do? Um, and then I finally, um, when I was in the cast of Mamma Mia, a friend of mine, Gerard Salvador, put it together a night at the Metropolitan Room um, of cast members. And so that was like my first intro of actually stepping on that stage, which was terrifying but so amazing and there's something so powerful about just you a microphone and a pianist you know and everybody it doesn't matter what you like look like how old you are um everybody wanted to like connect in those seats and every and and you had this point of view of like sharing stories you know i think because we are um, um actors of diverse back backgrounds we get pigeonholed a lot you know, in casting calls, but in a cabaret setting, it's just you and you can sing about what you want, talk about what you want, bring issues to light, talk about love, you know, all that stuff that you want to do. And, and that's what I love about um, the cabaret setting and the community has been so welcoming and it's just, it's so much fun. Um, I love seeing everybody kind of cheer each other on um, when we do the show, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh... You know, I often say that cabaret is the most selfless art form on the planet because in what other in what other performing art scenario do you get to see Christina Bersal as herself for an hour and a half and then go up to the bar and thank her? Not Lil Edie, but Christina Bersal. I mean, it's just like, it's, it's a gift. And it's also audience. terrifying. Because you're not like playing a role, you know. It's like you. If you, if people don't like you, it's they don't like you. <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. <laughs> they don't like your character. It's like they don't like you. But it's terrifying. I was terrified. My first discovery show. It, it was all in English. It was my first time performing in English. It was at the Metropolitan Room. I miss that place. It yeah. was beautiful. I miss it so much. But yeah, it's terrifying. <laughs> So I want to dive right in. Blaine, you brought it up. I want to call it out. Well, that's the, why we're here. That's exactly right. So there is no denying that the cabaret scene, generally speaking, is a homogenous group of old, sorry, older uh, white folk. Like the, the, the people, specifically the people in positions of power in the cabaret world are like, we're looking at club owners, bookers, people in charge of specific organizations. Mm -hmm. By and large, they are people of a certain age mm -hmm. and white. So in looking towards the future of cabaret and I, uh, one of the most moving cabaret experiences I've ever had was actually not in a cabaret room. It was sitting on my couch right over there watching the, uh, 
this most recent season of Pose mm -hmm. with the AIDS cabaret in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And it was not representative of the cabaret world that I mm -hmm. see by and large. And yet it was so moving. It was a representation of New York mm -hmm. and this generation of artists. What is it? felt like for the three of you to be people of color in an industry that is again the 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 the, the people who have who who wield the most power by and large are white what is that like and what changes would you hope to see in the future and you know even in the present during this pandemic how can we wield some sort of change now I would say it has been overall, it, it has been great. My personal experience overall, the, the majority of the people I meet, the majority of the people who have produced and run the spaces I've stepped into um, have been great and have been just great people, you know, generally great. Uh, the way we thought the world was uh, four months ago, generally great, right? Um, but now that we are redefining what matters, now that we are, we are not, we're rebuilding, not restoring things, and we have this opportunity, um, I, I, I'm going to start with that. I would like to see the space, you know, my big thing when I have the, I've done a lot, couple of these discussions with my school, my alma mater, and and I was on tour with Hamilton, so they've been active in the company and doing their step. And what I've been saying is that like, we can, everyone has to re see what they can do in their lane where they are right now. If every single person thought, what can I do with the specificity of my life and the circumstances, the places of privilege that I'm in, being in America is a crazy place for even the worst of us. But even for even the worst of us, it can be an amazing place. There's a place of privilege being here than some other places in the world. And so cabaret, exactly. You know, if I'm an owner of a cabaret space or I'm a, or, or whatever, you know, who am I letting in my doors? Who, what barriers have I put in place for people to be able to use my space, to even feel like they're welcome in my space? What kind of programming have I been showing to the world? Because I hate assumptions. I hate assumptions. I'm a biracial man in this country. I hate assumptions. But uh, image these things, they, they matter what you know what people see sometimes on the outside matter so my programming what what kind of space you know what I mean um and I think there's an opportunity for this these cabaret spaces and these people of power to open the door for everyone no matter really the medium to tell a part of themselves that is what cabaret is cabaret is not the thing I learned my senior year of high school of ABCD cabaret is not you know what Brian Stokes Mitchell does which I go to because <laughs> I'm obsessed with him but that is not cabaret it is an expression of self and however someone chooses to do that on stage in an intimate space you know, we can debate preferably with music, blah, 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 blah. But that's what it's about. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I would say to start off with like, how can I use this space to amplify voices and stories? That's what's happening around us, right? Yeah. We have, we're not, we're not seeing each other. We're not hearing each other. We're not validating people's existence. Um, if we do see each other, we're not hearing each other. You know, I, I see you, I see you, you don't hear me, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that's what this, that's what cabaret space, that's what it can offer. That's why I love it. I, um, and I'll stop. Um, it has been great to be in this space because as an artist, I'm constantly trying to find, I feel like my journey is to how to keep getting to my authentic self and everything I do. And it has been great to have this space, but it's also been exhausting because I also find myself muting 
taming, curating things to satisfy certain people, to satisfy certain bases. I get actually an enjoyment of bringing people together. I said, I'm a biracial man, a gay man in America. It is fun for me actually to be like, oh my God, I want to do a concert tonight and I want like this you know, sweet 60 year old lady who follows me in all my shows on Broadway. It's a white lady who loves all of Broadway. I want her to enjoy an evening and I want my uncle who's coming from Child's Park, Florida, who has never seen a Broadway show in his life, probably if I said the word would go, uh, not for me. I want to provide a night for them where like they, at both of those people get something. Right. You know what I mean? So it's not about shunning people. But when you get into a place where you start to feel like, oh God, I'm like curating just to satisfy or, oh, I know if I don't do this kind of number or say it like this or present it like this, you know, the people are gonna be like, that's not what we do here that, you know, and those things have to change. Those yeah. things have to change, you know? So yeah, I'll start. <laughs> She's long-winded. She's long-winded. I love it. She's long -winded. So <laughs> it's so interesting that, you know, a lot of these Zoom calls, like people, uh, I, I often hear, People are like, oh, uh, I'm, I'm just rambling or I'll stop. And I'm like, no, what you have to say is fabulous and fascinating. Ramble and say as Ramble. much as you want, please. Oh my God. Ray. Sorry, I froze. Am I back? You're, You're back. Again. Yes. Okay, good. I'm, I'm, I feel like my daughter's probably watching some Netflix cartoons. So I was like, okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add to, I think I, there was, um, especially being Korean American, if like, producers or you know cabaret spaces knew how big music is in the korean community especially the generation above me where all i grew up was watching vhs tapes of like old school korean singers with their big vibratos you know and i i wonder how we could do all outreach or cultivate that talent and bring it in because that would be such a different point of view i think a lot of um korean um, artists are you know they might be scared too of the cabaret space because it feels New York, it feels theater, it could feel elite, you know? Um, and is there a way to break that stigma down and be like, no, this is just a space. You have your music, you have your performances, come. Um, we can, we'll help you, we'll help you. You have the material, you have the audience, let us um, bridge that together. Um, Helen Park, who composed K-pop um, off-Broadway, um, amazing, fierce, um, Korean American composer. She did um, a cabaret. I think that was like the last one I saw, 54 Below, before you know the apocalypse happened. Um, and even she did it, and she was so excited and didn't realize that this was an avenue for her to express her art. She thought, as a Korean composer, who she didn't hadn't done many of these cabarets, but she thought you had to be like a cabaret artist. You had to have studied it. You had to know the formula. And and she didn't realize, no, it's it's about having your stuff, rehearsing, and bearing your heart out on stage. And everyone is ready to cheer you on and listen. And it, it was such a refreshing point of view that night, um, especially being a Korean American composer. So I think there just has to be a way to cultivate that and let people know, especially um, you know, non-Caucasian, more famous, well-known, you know, cabaret performers, that space is there and to come on in and try it. Yeah. Yes, totally. I think it's the perfect space, uh, like, for me, for my husband, that we are not well known yet. <laughs> hey. No, like, we are immigrants, we are trying to stop, we are, uh, like, singing in another language. I think it's, like, the perfect place when you can go, because you're presenting what you are, all your roots, your history, uh, and it's uh, the perfect spot when you can, where you can be, like, totally honest and I love what uh, Blaine was saying about like it starts with you and I think like for us as a cabaret artists like who what's the band that I am playing with am I being like diverse diverse in that like let it's people of color in my I might are they representing what I want to repre represent and I think uh, we all can do that. We mm -hmm. all can do that. Like what it's what we can do right away. I think that's a, a great thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, I uh, a discussion that keeps coming up is you know, I was taught 
that in cabaret, you can sing any song you want, any song in any genre written by any person. If you, because in cabaret, we have a contractual obligation to the lyricist, but not to the composer. So if you relate to the lyrics, mm -hmm. then you can build a musical arrangement to fit the story you are seeking to tell within that lyrical mm -hmm. context. Again, regardless of who wrote the song or who sang it originally, and now I'm having conversations with people that that I'm first of all, like, okay, who told me that white people? And then <laughs> now, like, is that okay? Is it okay if someone, you know, if, if they want to sing, I'm here from the color purple and they are a white person mm -hmm. in a cabaret space. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? How do you feel? How do you reconcile with, that kind of age old notion in cabaret that, it, you know, if it rings true to you, you can sing it regardless of mm -hmm. the race, the ethnicity, mm -hmm. the, the gender identity of the songwriter, the, uh, the original singer. I think for me, I think context is everything, right? That's, especially starting with a, con a, sh a cabaret, a show. I am, there's gonna be context around this whole thing, right? So, as an audience member, if first I'm not fair and open to there is a purpose behind what I'm seeing, I disservice myself as something potential that I'm able to receive and I do a disservice to the artist. But uh, if I'm the artist, um, you know, the rules, you know, there, I don't believe in rules. I just don't believe, I think we see people break the rules every time and we celebrate it and we celebrate land and we celebrate these people. And then we go back to like, but this is still the way it is. And this person, right? This black performer, this Latina, um, this Asian performer, they're special. They're the rule breaker. They're actually not the norm. And it's like, no, I'm not doing, I'm not breaking rules. I'm being myself. I'm being authentic. That should be the norm. You know, if you want to sing I'm Here for Color Purple, I love nothing more than a vocalist and a storyteller. So if you're going to nail it and there's a context of your life or, you know what I mean? Sure. You know, if you're going to add riffs on top, you know, all of that becomes choice. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and tell you what to do because if your why is there, the why you're doing it, if that is flushed out, and it's not selfish because cabarets are like you said, I actually didn't think of it that way. It's probably, I was going through like, oh, well maybe it's this. No, it is one of the most selfless arts because you're not using another, we can go meta on meta. Maybe you are, but you're not really using another medium to express yourself hypothetically, right? Mm -hmm. It's you. Um, so, you know, context is everything, but why? Why am I doing this? Do, do I need to do this? Is there another way? Is this the only way I can tell this moment? These are flushed out questions you should have asked yourself way before you got on stage, no matter what the performance is. That's, okay. that's the, and that's another thing I'll just be honest to is like, we see a lot of just, you know, just, you know, thought of it this weekend and plopped it up there, right? I'm not like a damper of creative expression. I think you should be doing it all day, every day. I just sang karaoke. I've made up a karaoke game with my friend on the spot. We just haven't sung in... There's places to express your art and there's a place to have responsibility for your art. And that is that space for sure. But for me, um, you know, it's why. I'll go a step further. The N-word, right? A lot of people, it's conversation about that. A lot of white people, oh, well, what, what, you know, what do you think and what's the answer? And I like to tell, I always say to them, first of all, there is no correct answer. That's your first problem. You, we seek everything as these definitives and, and we don't enjoy nuance and complex, complex ideas. And so there are people in my family who do not say that word. They will never say that word. They don't like the word. They, they, in their presence, people know that that's something they shouldn't say. And then there's people of my family who have embraced that word. It is culture. It is a word of love. It is a word of expression. You don't get to decide yay or nay, right? You just take someone for who they are and accept that it's their choice. It's their lens. It's their, if their why is strong enough, right? 
Mm -hmm. someone can play this game like, oh, well, what about racist people? But your why isn't strong enough, right? You're racist. (laughs) It's for hate. (laughs) You don't have a good why, you know? That's why I don't give you that deference. Um, So yeah, I that long-winded, long-winded. Love every second of it. The why is so important because if it's like, if your why is to be honest, yes. But if your why is to put something else down, you're like, oh, no, 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 no. And usually you can tell when someone is doing that. Or, that. Yeah. 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 And I'm, I, I feel like too, if somebody wants to sing, I'm here from the color purple. Um, again, as long as they're authentic and honest and trying not to sound like something else. Because we've all been there with those you know, performances where people are trying to sound like something else or, you know, put on a filter. I just want to see the honest artistic stylings that you have inside of you and see that on stage because for me that's honesty. That makes, you know, that for me justifies why you might be singing a song or, or why this, the song comes from a story you're telling. So that's just my my added stuff because yeah. I was like, Blaine, yes, work! Yeah. <laughs> but it's weird. It is a weird line, right? For Because it's like, do I necessarily want to hear and I'm telling you all the time from non POC people? Not really, right? Mm-hmm. But there is no hard and fast oh, rule oh. if you pay Falcon. And there's, if you, you know what I mean? Like, but you have to think of these things and yeah. you have to be prepared for if someone were to say, hey, I don't, why'd you do that? Why? You have to have a good reason. You have to have a legitimate discuss. There has to be a deep understanding. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. if someone says to you, well, do you know what I'm here in the context of the show means? And if you don't know that answer, then why did you sing it? Then why did you manipulate it? Why did you bend it? You know, if you didn't even honor the the original context, you know, right. and that's another thing. Know what you're singing. Know the history of your stuff. Know, you know what I mean? Like that's what gets us in trouble. <laughs> Just, yep. you know, yeah. yeah. Funny um, that we are having this conversation right now because uh, I think like it just clicked right now. I think that I'm taking the cabaret into my life right now. <laughs> and how am I presenting as, as an artist? I just did uh, Burn. Uh, it's mariachi arrangements. It's in Spanglish. And I, it was, I needed to say something, you know? And I did it because when I first, <laughs> I, I'm from Mexico. When I first heard that song, something about that song, I was like, that's mariachi. That sounds like tequila. Like she's hurt. She's talking about this <laughs> man. She needs a tequila. She needs to burn this. And, Ole, you know? and I was like, this is mariachi for me. This is like, oh my God, she needs to sing it in mariachi. I can hear the trumpets and accordion, all that thing. And I did it because I want to express that. And I've, I have always felt like I am like, I love the musical theater, uh, the perfect formula, you know? But I also love all these unrepresented things that we have, uh, like uh, as composers, as an actors, as POCs. So I wanted to bring my musical upbringing to these songs that I love. Mm-hmm. And I was doing it just because I, I needed to, to be heard. And uh, me, like, for example, in the musical theater business, I don't feel represented at all. There's no many immigrants on stage, you know. Uh, My accent is a big issue. So I don't see that on stage. It's like, I never see that. So I wanted to to put my my work out there and say, like, maybe this is not an issue. Because this is the, Mm. the the real people that I am seeing on the streets. Like in, if I'm in the subway, if I'm at the grocery store, I hear, I listen to a lot of different accents. Accents are just mouth fonts, they say. I love that. Um, so God. yeah, <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh. I love that. That's so I love sweet. that accents are mouth fonts. That is brilliant. Well, so uh, Blaine and, and Ray, I hear, I heard you talking about your why. And that reminds me of um, Start With Why by Simon Sinek and the, the golden circle that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it, right? Mm-hmm. And mm. I call those, you know, those shows that people put up in, um, in a day. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
they they get lumped into a category in my mind and I call them the because I can shows mm. or mm-hmm. because I want to. Mm-hmm. And that is not starting with why, that's starting with what. What are you doing while well, I'm doing a, a show of music that I love? But if you took the same set list and you started with why, and your why is like to blank, so that blank, so to your contribution, so that your impact, mm-hmm. it's like to share the music of Ella Fitzgerald so that her legacy lives on. And you did mm-hmm. the same stuff. It's providing a context that is generous, mm-hmm. purpose-driven and generative. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, 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 I wonder about, you know, looking at the, uh, the, the work that is being, is that was being done on Broadway before everything shut down and the kind of general lack of work that started with why, but also the lack of, of original work being written by people of color, telling their stories from their perspective, talking about being your most authentic self. How do you, if you could, if, if you could say anything to these producers who hold the keys to the kingdom about why, why is the great white way still so white? Why can't it be just Broadway for all? What would you say to them? How can we get these producers to start with a why that is more universal and authentic to the artists that are showing up at Pearl and Ripley Greer to audition? There is something I always tell sometimes, uh, like, a, like a creative team. I'm like, the role is Asian if an Asian person is in the role. You don't have to justify it. You don't have to put chocolates in my hair. I can't, you know, like, because I feel a lot of people make it, yeah, maybe they're overcompensating, but sometimes um, they're so um, sensitive of it that they sometimes go the other way. And I'm like, okay, 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 okay. But then I'm still like, a t- I'm still this, this percentage that you're trying to fulfill. If you just saw all of us as people, and if you saw a role as just, if, if a role is Asian, it's because I'm, I'm in it. I can be Asian American, I can play anything. Um, but the role is Asian if I'm in it. Um, and that's something that I've had to remind people because, uh, you know, sometimes an accent will come in and I'm like, I don't know about that. Like there'll be, I'll have to be the barometer of cultural sensitivity. <laughs> I'm sure we can all relate. Mm. <laughs> and it's it's just speaking up when that stuff happens too. And, um, and I'll have some other ideas too, but that was the one thing that popped in my head that I always feel like I have to call out sometimes. Well, I think there's a uh, something that um, Ali Bigori, who works in the diversity and inclusion realm for um, d- um, actors with disabilities, she said that there is that you know being an ally is very 2006. And now we have to graduate from being an ally to an advocate, and from an advocate to an activist. Mm-hmm. Being an ally is passive. Mm-hmm. Being an advocate is like yes, here you may use my platform or let me speak for you with your consent and permission being an activist is taking on the responsibility of fighting for causes that might not directly impact you but are directly impacting people in your life so i'm as important as it is for you ray to be the cultural barometer it is equally important for everyone in the room to call that shit out, even if they are not Asian American. The bald Jewish guy in the corner, when he hears something about yeah. a potentially racist accent coming up, they that has to be the culture that's created that everyone is being an activist and not just a passive ally anymore. We're better yeah. we have to be a- actively anti-racist. Yeah, I I would say two things. One, just piggybacking off of that, I think there is, what's tricky about this time right now is we are in a, we should be in a reflection and planning and transition space. And when any kind of change has that space before the change happens, it's it, it's within us, this space and it's it manifests physically so there also is something to be said like I was just thinking about the situation you know like right like say theater started back up you know 
in four months. Ha ha ha. Like, let's, <laughs> let's all be good actors and play our imagination games. And say it started back and say that happened and I was in the room with Raymond. Well, I'll be honest with you what I would first do. If I heard it and Raymond didn't say anything, I might go up to Raymond first and say, hey, I'm not trying to get in, but I heard this. How did it make you feel? Did you want to say anything? Because there is in this reflection and planning period, there is space where you have to allow and feel empowered if you are a person of color or a minority of any kind to, to speak up. And we have to allow that space to happen. And sometimes I've heard um, friends of mine say, um, you know, don't feel like you have to speak for me. I am my own person. You know what I mean? Um, so I just wanted to toss that out there because it is like, this could be a whole nother discussion of like performative activism and just this reactionary actions that a lot of people are taking um, based in good intentions because we all realize the time is now, right? Um, and I guess picking back on that, what I would say to producers is it's like, they're in a, I don't want to say tricky because you chose to be this, but you're in a tricky spot, right? Like you hypothetically, if I were to put it on paper, somehow the money is going to fall in the job description, unfortunately, right? For a producer, whether or not they like the work, love the work, that is their job. So two things I would go back to what we we're talking about before is like, what is the why? Like, what is the why of you being a producer? Is it because you want to share stories? You want to share, you know, a producer in theater? Is it because you recognize we have the power to illuminate voices and we teach and, and, and change history by retelling it and you want to be a part of that and you might come for money or want to make money. So you see this great partnership of the commercial aspect of, you know, like I'm speaking New York, really, um, you know, that's cool too. Like, that's also cool, but why am I doing it? And then when things get into the money aspect, the hiring, the actual like nuts and bolts, I, your power, where do you have power? Are the people around you diverse? Are the people that are telling this story diverse? Even if it's not a diverse story, even if I'm telling a musical, talk about, or this is crazy, you know, never mind. I'm not gonna go, that's gonna be a horrible joke, right? Even if I'm telling the worst story, you know what I mean, that involved one race, is all hands on deck reflective of that? You know what I mean? What am I doing with my money? Am I, you know what I mean? Like, we all can't be Hamiltons, but we could, actually, I think we can. Am I educating? Is that a part of my plan at the, at no matter the level I'm at? Do I see myself only successful when I've made the money? Do I only, you know what I mean, impact or speak up for the lost voice when I've got the money? And that all goes back to the why. And I think that's what this whole, I think that's what's happening right now. This whole on a, just a big, big level. Why are we doing this? What are we doing? What are these relationships? Why are, what, you know what I mean? Like everyone is asking themselves that. And I think to skirt it to something maybe more materialistic or easy actually is a disservice. Cause that's what I'm hoping producers are doing with their downtime. How can I help? Why am I doing this? Let me double down on it. And if you're not, it will be obvious. You won't be asked in the space if the majority of, of us decide we're just not that, we're not doing that anymore, right. you know? Yeah. And we are all learning. Like, oh, yes, yes. We are in, we have to be a team. Mm -hmm. Like, I love what you said. Like, first, I would go to the person and talk to him. That's the smartest thing to do. And maybe I wouldn't think of that at, three months ago, you know? Like, I wouldn't. I actually didn't. I, three months ago, I was like, go out. And then I was like, okay, wait a minute. This whole thing's about relationship. Talk. Let me go first. <laughs> Let me not get my ego in the way. Hi. Let me, you know. And I will also, I would like to address something that was going on. Uh, that there was like a lot of people being allies. Uh, I've seen casting calls like Mexican story, blah, 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 by white people, composer, white people, mm. choreographer, white people. And mm. I was like, mm. okay, they're telling my story, mm. but from, you know, like, it's mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. okay, I, if they are in this, uh, flag like oh because we are being allies we are using our privilege to tell your story mm -hmm. you know 
And it's like, okay, if you want to help me, then hire a, you know, Latino person, uh, a staff, or I don't know. That, that, that was something that was going on. And I was like, and produced. A lot of plays were produced like in that. And I was like, wow. Am I the only one who's saying this? Am I the only one who thinks that's not correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and talking about money and then making cabaret accessible, some of the best theater I have ever seen have um, been at theaters that are nonprofit theaters. They have the financial means to potentially take a chance on a show because they're getting funding not solely from ticket sales. There is not a single nonprofit cabaret room in New York City. Not one. Which begs the question, you know, if the money for the room is primarily coming from ticket sales, if the booker doesn't know the person, how are they going to take a chance on someone who might not be able to bring in 134 seats, even though it is a show that has never been seen before. And I wonder how cabaret would change if there was one cabaret room that was nonprofit. What type, like- Has there ever been one, Ari? I, you, I don't know. And there might be like cabaret venues that are tied to nonprofit organizations, but like, okay a business that is solely a cabaret room mm -hmm. whose business model is nonprofit. I, mm -hmm. I don't know of one. If mm -hmm. there is one, I s humbly stand correct. <laughs> but I don't know, but I don't know if there has ever been one. How cool is a theater that was nonprofit does it create some sort of cabaret space that was part of the funding? Like that could be- Joe's yeah. Pub, I guess. Okay. The public's nonprofit, but I don't know if Joe's Pub itself, if that, Cabaret spaces business model is nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Were it not for the public, we wouldn't have Hamilton. We wouldn't right. have Fun Home. Right. We wouldn't right. have these revolutionary stories. Right. And, and and because of the public, the soft power happened too. And we were they were so brave with putting the money behind it because they could and they wanted to. They wanted to get this message out there about this Asian American I, musical. So yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. There's there's just but the thing is too. There is you know, there is a way. There is, you know, if the vision one day is to do a nonprofit house and a full space and I can't do that right now or I can't, what what can I do now? Can I offer one night of my week to an open mic and we don't chart, you know, can I do that? Is, oh, I can't do a full night. Can it be a day? Can it be, you know, 54 Below has done great, um, some great work in trying to offer times and slots for people who necessarily wouldn't, you know, because 54 definitely has a specific clientele. And that's the other thing. I, I have no problem with standards, you know, what you're trying to offer, being specific, like, that's not what we're talking about, right? We're talking about still within that, am I a part of this larger community? Am I a part of the thing that I'm saying, I'm, I'm offering a space for people to tell their stories. Well, then why am I closed off to only one type of story? Is that me, you know? And I, what can I do? Can I get together with more than one? Can a 54 Below get together with some of the other spaces and they together create a space? Or uh, There's so many ways and this place we're in, you know, it's it, it decisions quick to, and, 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 it's, and it's large and it's overwhelming and it's, and it's just, why? What am I doing? Why? What can I do today with the space I have today? You know? Um, and you'll find that you could do something. You'll find you could do, you'll do something that has not been offered. Even that, even if that's not the end goal, you know? Right. And, and um, with the technology of like these videos and YouTube and this online stuff, like maybe that'll also give people the the opportunity to see the talent that's out there, yeah. familiarize with themselves oh, yeah. doing what. So yeah. the more that minority performers put put out there, because literally if you're singing in a bathroom and singing your heart out, great, put a mic and an accompaniment, you're good to go. You know what I mean? Like it's mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, speaking of why, I'm curious, what does it mean for each of you to be an artist in this current political climate? What does that mean to you? <laughs> it is insane, I would say, <laughs> on a physical, material, worldly level, it is an insane ride. It is um, unfortunate that, you know, the in certain, being an artist, um, you learn humbly, you learn, your, you know, your place when, 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 when life happens and you learn how you can contribute. And unfortunately we've learned, we are not nurses, we're not doctors. Those people need, those people need the spotlight, right? Artists, we don't need it. So on that level, not having the job and, the, and just the, it's like what's happening. And then on the other level, the other side of it, and I've been kind of thinking about this, I think it's something we all subtly know with the quarantine and the pause that like, oh wow, how nice is it to actually have time to sit and be a part of this thing that's happening and be have my feet wet in it and have a point of view and be a part of the conversation so that I can, I'm feeding the artist so that I can have something to say, you know, I... You were supposed to be a reflection of culture. We're supposed to be a reflection of what's happening. And I said the other day, if you're not participating in it, how can you be that? And um, we have to release to everyone is being told, go ahead, sit down right quick. Let's go ahead, look left, look right. Let's ponder what's going on. You know what I mean? And it's humbling. I didn't want to say exciting. That's why I laughed at first. I was like, it's not, a, it's not, but it's humbling to be in this time, it's humbling to be in a space where I know we're gonna make change. We as artists can be a part of the conversation. We're going to get to um, continue this conversation with what's coming from us down the road, you know? Right. So I guess it's good because this is what we're, this is what it's about, I guess, right? right? Yeah. Right? I'm an artist because I'm not there for the money. I have to pay my bills, but that's a whole nother combo, right? right. Yeah. For me, I think it has been like, watching a play, watching a movie, like literally what we are living right now, you know? Because you're like, okay, this is happening. Oh, wow, that's scary. Oh, oh, shoot, okay, okay, plot twist. Oh my God, this is gonna change. <laughs> yes, we can do it, you know? Like, it's like watching a play, watching a musical, watching a TV show. And you're like, yes, you can do it. Okay, you have to be the hero. Then it's like this, you have to be a hero of your story. Mm. Um, yeah. And mm. I think we are, uh, I feel very moved by all the artists that are speaking up, that are, we all are learning, and we are all trying our best to, to claim our power, because we have power. We tell the stories, like you said, we are the reflect of our society. So I think this was necessary this time. We are learning a lot. And I am very sure that if we start with us, we can we can change for good, of course. And I think it's so important to be an artist during this political climate because we just know how to express messages in so many different ways. You can only say something verbally so many times. <laughs> if you make a song or a painting or a sculpture or a video, it makes an even bigger impact. And I think that's, it's, and because we are all, we work with our hearts. So we know how to enunciate our hearts. I think we're just more yeah. outspoken. So if something really angers us or we want something to be at attention, we will say it because um, we're coming from a place of good. We come from the cabaret space, the theater space. It's all about, we have a good time. It's all about teamwork. And I feel like we are such big, strong, you know, advocates for teamwork. Yes, collaboration. <laughs> yes. Yeah, government. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, speaking of teamwork, who are people in our industry right now that uh, are being that that are inspiring you? That are that are leaders that you um, that 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 you are inspired by nowadays? I think I'm really inspired by some of these coalitions that are coming together. Most. Um, uh, 
because I think this whole thing is about conversation and including more people. So, um, you know, Broadway for Racial Justice, Broadway Advoca Advocacy Coalition, um, Black Theater United, you know, we see you all in very different lanes, all with very different weapons on how to fight these wars, but all valid. And what I'm most humbled by is that there are groups of people, that there is no one person, there is no you know, and I think these people who do have the power, either who've been in the trenches, like Tanya Pinkins, who when she puts out a piece, you sit and you read it and you envelop all of that and you take all in, you know, our, our leaders who've been in the fight. And then there's people, I think, who have just been given platforms or may have just realized how important their platforms are or people who know it. And I think those people also, they know what to do. They know, you know, they know, yeah. you know. So for me, it's these groups. It's the, the this, this, you know? Yeah. yeah. Teamwork. Yeah. Business, yeah. And then the people that are, uh, that are speaking out um, because they just don't give an F anymore. They want <laughs> to, you know, they want to finally bring it to the limelight. And that is hugely inspirational, whether mm -hmm. it's through a video or through Twitter or whatever. It's refreshing and important and invigorating to, because then as a, person of color it's like oh it's, it hasn't just happened to me it's mm. happened to oh it happened to you and you mm. I think you're at this level like oh shit so let's let's all be aware of it and, and hashtag teamwork it together mm -hmm. uh, yeah totally this, these people who start the we see you movement I think uh that they are uh giving us a platform to tell these kind of stories that you only tell to your best friend you know and then nobody knows about it. And when you read it, it's like, oh gosh, uh, Karen Olivo, who started like, you know, show me your receipts. That <laughs> people are picking up. I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. The cool thing is too, I feel like within the Asian community and the Asian friends, like we'd always speak, like, pss, pss, pss. but then we read about it happening to other communities. We're like, oh, they're doing it to other people too. Hello. And Hello. then that's been, yeah, that's been yeah. enlightening and eye opening. Yeah. Because power knows no race, and we know that. And that's what we're really talking about, right? Like, we're talking about power on the back of uh, Black um, lives not mattering. But we're talking about power. And that's something we all, as POCs and minority and people, you know, we, we, we relate to. That's what we're going out about. That's what this is about. I saw... Um somebody posted on instagram that they were they had a, a stunt double on a on a shoot i saw that yeah their stunt double was in blackface from head yeah. to toe and the actress went to the to the showrunner to the producer and was like were you not like i feel like maybe my stunt double, as a black woman i think maybe my stunt double should be mm a black woman mm -hmm. and the producer said there are no black stunt doubles in los angeles and shouldn't you be grateful to be here so much to unpack also like to start bullshit on the fact that there are no <laughs> black yeah. stunt doubles in los correct. angeles correct correct that's correct. what correct. also on like a universal level i feel like we as actors have been told you are dispensable mm. If you can't do it, there are 12 people who will do it and who will mm -hmm. happily accept $150 mm -hmm. to work at a theater company while also serving tables. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. So the idea that the fact that you're here at all, you should be grateful. Mm -hmm. That's now going away. It's like, why would I be grateful yeah. to be working with somebody who is in blackface, to be working for right. someone who is okay but not only right. doing it but defending it when it's called out right right where's also where's my the... i'm grateful for my check that's what you owe me and what i owe you you owe me the check <laughs> i owe you the work because this is a job right yeah. so that's like, again those power structure it's like you know we're now all realizing like wait a minute hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> this is a this is a job like I don't, I'm not defined by this job. So no longer am I going to take that type of pressure of you should be grateful to be here. I don't need you to tell me. I know I'm grateful. I'm, I showed up. <laughs> I showed up to do the job. Uh -huh. We're talking about the job now, the like actual, you know what I mean? And like, I think I'm glad that that's happening, you know, because I think the whole industry is starting to realize like, this is a job. You owe people the respect. You owe people an HR department. You owe people opportunity. You owe people 
you know what I mean, what a job is supposed to do. This isn't a power, you know what I mean? This isn't high school theater. And that's what it, and that's why we've gotten ourselves in this trouble as a theater community, right? Like it's heartbreaking to be like, oh, whoa, I thought we were the most progressive. And then you realize, A, this is the power of racism. It does, it, it knows no limits, power and racism. It knows no industry, no type of person. It is deep and dark and can get everybody. And that's what, I think that's what we're really all seeing, you know, right. but I'm, I'm glad this is like re like if we don't come back from this changed or if you don't come back into this space as a changed person, I think it's going to be so obvious. Don't you know what I'm saying? Like, it's gonna, so you better, everyone. It's already been better. obvious. Too. It has been obvious. Like you right. get your house in order. Why am I doing this? Why am I here? Because I think we're asking for people's whys these days. Do you value me? Do you value human life? Do you value story? Do you know? Because that's why I'm here, you yeah. know? Well, I think a lot of people have, in, in the past, I say BC, before coronavirus. <laughs> BC. BC 19. <laughs> people <laughs> felt or were taught to believe that mm. our worth as artists is completely dependent upon the jobs that we book correct and yet now mm. when there are no jobs hello somehow our worth as artists mm -hmm. has not diminished mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what a shame that we needed a world where there were no jobs for us to book to yeah. realize that right. the jobs are in fact just jobs if i don't work for 10 years i don't stop being an artist for those 10 years yeah. Yeah. i stop being paid from certain people to right. be in for my artistry <laughs> or certain amounts I don't know. right right but yeah. just like how can we remind ourselves and our community of our individual and collective worth mm. when there are also jobs to book when we go back to it's between you, you know me and one other person for the job mm. how do we remind ourselves that it's not us against one another, but it's our entire community against the people in positions of power who have conditioned us to be competitive. That there is teamwork. Yeah, and, and personal work, really. It, I mean, especially a question like that, that is, that's the work where we're saying you have to do that. You have to use this time and reflect. You know, I, I have, therapy is new to my life as of two years ago. It's a huge new journey. I am, I will speak on it, speak on, I don't care where I am. If you aren't someone who uh, takes the time, the same amount of time that you do to singing, dancing, practicing, filing for job, all the effort you put into every other area of your life, if you're not taking that time for this and this, you're, the, you're, missing, the, you're missing the trick to realizing that you are not your, this identity. Do you know what I mean? Right. Actor becoming performer becomes my identity. I'm actually much more than an artist. I'm a human being first who loves and what deserves to be love. And, and that's what I am first. And art happens to be the lens in which I express myself. But only I can do the personal work to remind myself, despite me navigating my artistic in this, my artism in this, is that a word? My artism? It is in now. This world, it is now. It so is now. irregardless. They put that in the dictionary. So how about that? <laughs> so irregardless of that not being a word, um, you know what I mean? How do I then accept the rules of the game? You know what I mean? Because there are rules. There are, there is, you know, this is the business we're in. This is the, you know, not every space can get every performer. Some spaces have to say, you know what, these are for these prepared, you know, blah, 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 who've reached that mark. That doesn't make you any less. It doesn't mean anything. You know, you remind yourself, I am not my identity. This is just, because identities can be changed. We do them. We do them over the course of our lives, but we're not like watching ourselves. And you don't realize like, I have changed my identity. You start as a child and you're a son and then you become a mother and a lover and a father. You change and grow. And there's this resistance to that. I'm getting to a place. I had therapy the other day, so I'm, I'm getting to a place. But like, you know what I'm saying? Like that, that has to be the work of an artist because then you can control the way you treat your peers. You can control the way you interact with everyone. Like that, that's the work that I'm, again, that's on you. That's, that's right. you know, everyone has to do this. Actor, stagehand, producer, director, audience member, you know.
Yeah. Um, when we look back at this pandemic, what will you be most proud of? Number one is that my daughter learned how to swim because if I wasn't <laughs> home, she we would have had to pay somebody. And now we can uh, buy and snorkel once it's all free and you know safe too. Yes. But I'm proud that we're all still creating, that the pandemic didn't just stop us so that we're, I mean, of course, everyone has their timeline. Some people have to take a break, some people have to refocus. But like, I feel like a lot of my friends are creating in whatever way they can. I think we realized how important art and theater and music is to us and that mm. not even, you know, the apocalyptic virus can, can kind of stop that inner stuff that's in here. Yeah. I think what I've learned is that we all are the same. Mm. That's like, it seems like so obvious, mm. but it's not. Like being here, uh, like in quarantine, it's like, okay, you don't have guilt. Me neither, okay? <laughs> um, you're scared, me too. You can't pay rent. I I'm like you, you know? It's like, we are, or we are, are the same. And that's, it's obvious, but it, but it feels for me like, okay, I, I am, I am not alone in this world. Yeah. I have all these people who's like me yeah. and it's, uh, and hopefully they're all wearing masks yeah. <laughs> yeah. to see yourself in others. That's whew. yeah. I'll be, I think I'll be, I know on the hindsight, I'll be like, will you survive? I made a joke to someone else. I was like, when we're, when we make it to that, older age and we're talking to the babies and they are just eye rolling because we keep saying COVID over and over because we're like you don't understand what it was like you know um I think I'll be over survived but I think and it's something I'm trying to do now I'm I think I'll be I I know I'll be proud that I was conscious throughout that's what I've been trying to do every day and remind all of us as we go through it to like not run from what's happening right now but embrace it because so much good is happening on so many levels and, you know, climate change, race. I mean, this time has, it's just crazy what good it's done. Um, and it's funny how it's the good stuff that actually matters and lasting, right? Money, yeah. not lasting, right? Money, <laughs> what, what are we learning about money? Oh, someone can print it and give it to you. Yeah. You know, all these things, you know what I'm saying? So I, I hope that's what we see, but we'll see. We're not out of it yet. There might be a couple, you know, like, oh God, that Years. was a waste of time. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, I, we're uh, at the end of our discussion and I uh, uh, would like to end with a question that I ask everyone. It's my favorite question. If you could invite five people to dinner, who would you invite? Ray, you've already answered this question, so feel free to come up with another five or just oh my what? Gosh. Five people. Aye. This is unfair. Five people. I gave sort of an intellectual answer last time, and I'm like, the Power Rangers! <laughs> 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 Who am I inviting to dinner? So difficult. Um, five I, Five, you go, you got it, you got it, go. No. <laughs> okay, maybe we can go, cause I can't draw five. So maybe we can like one, one, yeah, one yeah, and see what happens. Good. Okay, I think I'm inviting, I wanna invite, I wanna, I wanna do a Gandhi and or, I want them to have the same chair in an MLK moment. I would love to hear how they think we can, get past this moment now. That's my first chair. Oh my God. You don't have anybody? <laughs> I would say um, Frida Kahlo. Yeah. I love her work, yeah. her resilience, her, mm. she was a strong woman. I'm Very inviting strong. my grandma. I want everyone to meet my grandmother who's over at dinner. She's coming. I would like to invite my dad. He passed away when I was nine years old. He was mm -hmm. also an artist. So I would like to, yeah, have dinner with him. I'm going to go with Brian Stokes Mitchell because I'm obsessed. Oh. That's the reason why I have the three name, Blaine Alden Krauss. That's a longer story, but 
It's tied into Brian Stokes. I would love to hear that story at some point. It has to do with my dad being a very upset man about the potential of the name not making it. He's like, what? Um, I love Fitzgerald. Oh, yes. 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 She broke so many barriers. Oh, my God. She was a goddess. Yes, yeah. Oh yeah, Ella Fitzgerald will be online. I'm gonna Jesus, go with Jesus. Just uh, like yeah, I could like YouTube some of his stuff, so I could like Wait, send who? it out to the rest of America. Jesus. <laughs> oh. Ah, but just be like, what did you mean? Just because there's a little bit of like <laughs> fighting about what you meant. So, but me- only on Twitter. <laughs> Let's solve all of these nuanced questions on 240 characters. Let's do it there. Let, that's that's where yes. we do it. That's hilarious. That is so good. I'm going to put in Michelle. I think I always say Brock, but did you see Becoming or read it? Hello. Yes. I'm watching it Hello. as soon as we hang up. That is next on Everything. my list. Everything. Oh my gosh. It's Brock Michelle. Oh, yeah. 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 Because um, she could tell us all about the Barack. So I want the Michelle. We get him from the side. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would say Malala. Oh, yeah. Mm. yeah. I love what she's doing. Uh, she's mm-hmm. going so dead. Mm. <gasps> Killer Mike. Do you know who Killer Sorry, Mike is? Who say Francia? Uh, she said Malala. I said Malala. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. Who's Anything Killer specific? Mike? Killer Mike is a rapper, and he's a Grammy Award-winning rapper and activist. And he has he has used his platform in a way that is just jaw dropping. He's the epitome. I think if you're an artist and you want to go there and be like, I really want to use this artistry and, and, and go there. Killer Mike, he's the most awesome. He was one of, um, not to get political, but he was one of Bernie Sanders' biggest advocates. And um, he does a lot of good for the black community in Atlanta. And he has a great series on Netflix. It's called Trigger Warning, I think. Yeah. Um, it's brilliant. Oh, and prof- he is profound and brilliant. And if ever you feel like, I am not the person who could, I don't look like, I'm not me. How could I get, he is someone to like learn like, oh, oh, oh. He may, it makes you feel good and easy about it. Yeah, he's a recent one I've obsessed with. I would add, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this. India Irie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Irie. Uh, Irie? Yeah. That's yes. a right pronunciation. I love her. She's so spiritual. Mm. What she wrote, writes is like, oh, my God. I think she's so intelligent, <sighs> like, in all the way. It's everything. Yeah. everything. I'd, have to, I'd have to invite Margaret Cho, because she was, like, the first Asian person I saw on TV. And I was like, oh, if she can do it, I can. And I feel like, please yes. make me laugh. Yeah. Yeah. I never answer this, but I, right now, I don't, I, I think I would, screw five of them. I would want to sit down and have coffee with Tiffany Haddish. Uh. <laughs> I want to know so much, but also what is it like to be um, a, what is the, the intersectionality of being a black Jewish woman mm-hmm. in today's world? What is that oh. like? When there is such a, a vocal presence in the Jewish community that is, you know, we are minorities too. I'm like, yeah, or like saying that Judaism is a race. Mm-hmm. If Judaism is a race, then what do you say to black Jews? Mm-hmm. It, it's just, so I'm fascinated to hear her story. <sighs> yeah. And I'm glad you brought, you brought that up too, because that's that whole conversation is a timely conversation with now. And just again, like, are we opening each other up to each other or how hard are these barriers we're defining? Cause in a good 40 to 60 years, everyone's going to have a cross. <laughs> so the barrier game won't work for a while. There's going to be, you know, the majority of this will be Brown. The experiment, we're going to see this experiment in a way that people are going to be like, what? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I love Tiffany Haddish too. Cause like that, that comedy show, They Ready on Netflix where so, she like passed the mic to like, I didn't know of these amazing, fierce female comedians of color. And they yeah, all made me yeah, laugh. Yeah. I'm obsessed with them. Yeah. It was like- And look at what, what she's what doing she with, you know, so most people would see her being the beginning of her career, the beginning of, now she's a pretty famous person. It take, fame just takes, a, you know, nothing with the definitions of, but like she immediately turned around, immediately 
yeah. you know, her, she, her story is I'm the person that like has been around and no one's gotten, and she spent time turning around. You know what I mean? It's, uh-huh. it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. I would want to ask her about Louis Farrakhan. Mm. How, like for a man mm. who had so many eloquent things to say about mm-hmm. the black experience when mm-hmm. very few people were saying the things that he was saying, mm-hmm. but also somebody who is controversial, so, yeah, like virulently anti-Semitic, mm-hmm. like a, a, a well-known proud, self-proclaimed Jew hater Mm -hmm. as a black Jewish woman. Mm -hmm. I would be curious to know what she thinks about him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this whole, this, I mean, you know, Hamilton conversation right there. This whole, there are layers to this thing called life. (laughs) Haven't we learned that? Yeah. Yeah. That's a cabaret name right there that we should Yes. (laughs) There. (laughs) <laughs> give me two songs give me a song that i'm singing into it give me one come on what do we got what was the name of it layers to this thing called life um <laughs> that's life do, um, that's life um layers i don't know why why what what's why is sweeney todd wait what's a rush what's a hurry why is that popping <laughs> into my head like a good option i can fit it in of course we can fit it I'm in. like a, i'm like such a disney like Homo, I'm like, why is part of your world or like? <laughs> <laughs> I like, I maybe Migratory V from Myths and Hymns. Good. Just like the idea yeah. of like, yeah. what if we all just flew together and worked yeah. together? Teamwork. Yeah. Like what if that's what God was seeing? Yeah. Not yeah. A bunch of fighting, but us flying together. Yeah. Radical, radical idea. <laughs> Lorencia, do you have a song? Are you like? Ruminating, do you have anything? Yeah. To- I can think of it once. Not one? It's okay. She's on arrangements. She's on. Yeah, I got her right. for like, okay, I'm like, oh, this yeah. is the I'm like, this song is basic. What can we do with it? And then I know you've got us on. Because yes. I don't know if y'all have heard her arrangement. I'm gonna of, check more stuff out now. Of Burn, Mariachi Burn. I need to hear that. I'm about to YouTube spiral myself. Need to hear that. It is. Arguably the definitive rendition of the song. Hey! <laughs> you heard it here, folks. Hey, you heard it here. <laughs> oh, thank you all so much. This was amazing, delightful, delicious. Thank you so, 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 so much for having this conversation. Thank and you. you. Many. Yes. Thanks for having So nice talking to all of y'all. This was Yes. Thank so- you guys. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Bye.